Myths and legends about a mysterious southern land have captivated man's imagination since antiquity. Heroic exploits and races were to come, but first we needed to know what was down there. I visited Trinity House to meet Edgar King and learn about the discovery of Antarctica. There's some serious history in the building. Let me show you this globe, for example. Um, it's a globe dating back to 1824, depicting Captain Cook's travels around the world and Captain Vancouver. There's definitely something quite significant missing here when we're thinking about Antarctic exploration, and that is Antarctica itself. So where was it at this time? Well, exactly. It was down there, but it was very foggy and very cloudy down there, so not many people were brave enough to go and explore that sort of area. Um, so, and uh, knowing it was very inhospitable and cold, they decided to turn back. But occasionally they would bump into bits of land. This is what they would have noticed, and this is where they're probably the good hunting grounds were. So this is the Antarctic Peninsula. So when they made their first voyages down here on, on the Discovery, and then later the Nimrod, we didn't really know. They, they didn't know what was there at all. They weren't even sure it was a single continent, were they, at the time? There would have been, it would have been more linked together, yes. There would have been various, uh, the Norwegians had done a lot of explorations down there, the Russians had, the French had, so there would, it would have been started to be pieced together. In 1912, Scottish explorer Robert Falcon Scott found himself locked in a race to be the first man to reach the South Pole. His rival was a Norwegian called Roald Amundsen. After a terrific struggle through ice and snow, weighed down by scientific equipment, Scott and his team made it to the pole, only to find a Norwegian flag buried in the ice. Amundsen had beaten him by 33 days. Frostbitten, exhausted and heartbroken, the British team began their return leg. But tragically, just 11 miles from the next food depot, they succumbed to the cold and froze to death. Two years later in 1914, a fellow British explorer, Ernest Shackleton, mounted an expedition to Antarctica. But, like Scott before him, the freezing conditions proved too much. His ship, Endurance, was caught in pack ice and crushed. They weren't expected home for months and knew they would have to launch their own rescue. Leaving his men on Elephant Island, Shackleton struck out over 800 miles of Southern Ocean to the closest human settlement on South Georgia. I visited Dulwich College, Shackleton's old school, where keeper of the archives, Callista Lucy, showed me the James Caird, the boat in which Shackleton made this epic voyage. This is the centrepiece of that amazing rescue. What had become of uh, what started out as a voyage of discovery and exploration and turned into this heroic effort to rescue. They had to rescue themselves. There was no one who knew where they were. So they arrive at Elephant Island, which is the last rock in a, a string of little islands called the South Shetlands, but they still need to find help. So they immediately start um, under the direction of Harry McNeish, the brilliant ship um, carpenter, to improve the James Caird, and Shackleton then hand-picks the five who will go with him. So the Southern Ocean that they had to cross is an extreme um, uh, place with very high winds, incredible currents, and these enormous waves. And also, it was the Antarctic winter, which is the worst time. So it was April 1916, and they were facing sometimes 30 meter waves. And they also were in darkness most of the voyage. They had the sun only twice, when Frank Worsley, the brilliant navigator, was able to get a sighting with his sextant to try and work out where they were. And despite this, he was able to land them on um, South Georgia, this tiny little pinprick in the middle of South Atlantic. So at one point they're exhausted and Worsley and Crean say to Shackleton, we've got to have a rest. So he takes away their watches and he lets them sleep for four minutes. And after that he wakes them up and says, come on now, you've had four hours, we're going off again. And they believed him. They all had such faith in him. There was something charismatic about him that made his men really trust him. Shackleton had carefully chosen Frank Wilde to be left in charge of the men on Elephant Island and he was amazingly skillful in keeping up morale and he would say to them every morning, shake out your sleeping bags, get yourself ship shape, the boss will come today. Every morning for four and a half months this is what he said and they believed his enthusiasm and his um, belief in the boss actually 
filtered through to these men. Um, by the time they arrived, some of them actually weren't able to crawl out of the hut they made out of the upturned boats, but they'd only lost a few digits and toes to um, frostbite, but basically they were all still alive. I think the way that Shackleton was able to turn this round from what had set out as this um, um, voyage of exploration and turn it into this incredible rescue mission that came off, he pulled it off, was because of his skill, um, his skill as a leader, but also his determination not to let people down, not to um, give up and um, just be his, his stubbornness really was what pulled them through.